generalizing, it's a typical uh, colliery in the sense that um, it had two shafts, it had a boiler house that provided the motive power, it had steam winders, it had two steam winders uniquely and a wonderful piece of engineering was number two winder who was there, it was installed at the outset and it was there at the closing of the colliery and it was a, a twin cylinder vertical steam engine a wonderful piece of engineering um, that was there from the outset and the, at the closure of the colliery the number one pit winder was a horizontal uh, steam winder made by a company called Dunlop and Meredith that was installed in 1935 as part of the refurbishment and re-engineering of number one pit uh, but what was unique about Wheatley Hill, if you compare it to its parent colliery, for want of a better expression, Wheatley Hill Colliery in 1869 was sunk by the owners of Thornley Colliery. Now, Thornley Colliery um, lies to the northwest of Wheatley Hill, and the new winning, as they called it, was, was to be Wheatley Hill Colliery. And that was to um, extract the coal that lay to the south and the east of Thornley Colliery, so that's how Wheatley Hill Colliery developed. Uh, Thornley Colliery, as a contrast, uh, had two shafts, one of which had an, an electric winder, um, the other one was a steam winder, but Thornley had one coal drawing shaft, as we referred to, where all the, the mined coal was brought to the surface in, in one shaft, and the other shaft was for materials, and for uh, taking the men underground and bringing the men back to the surface before and at the end of the shifts. But where Waitley Hill was so different is that number one pit and number two pit actually operated as two different entities. They had different sized tubs, they had different cages, the men were paid different wages. Number one pit mined the deep seams the good quality coking and steam and gas coal seams. Number two pit mined the higher seams. Um, and as I say, the, the men that worked down number one pit used tubs, uh, little rail wagons for want of a better expression, that could, you know, they were 800 weight in terms of coal that would go into one. If you worked in number two pit, then the tubs you used were 10 hundred weight tubs, totally different sizes. It was quite unique and I, I never knew another colliery in the area like that. And even in the, in the 1960s, 1965, they ceased coal production in number one pit. And I can remember the actual situation where uh, it was recorded as number one pit closed. Yes, it closed in terms of um, coal mining, but it <laughs> it didn't close because it it was the it was the air shaft for the rest of the colliery. But they ceased mining in 1965. Uh, again, till the colliery closed, Wheatley Hill never used um, continuous mechanized mining. The idea of mechanized mining is um, you started your work at the beginning of the week and you continuously produce from coal faces using machines a continuous supply of coal um, and, and that was mechanized mining you, you, you took a strip of a coal face and it by a machine it was loaded onto conveyor by the machine and then everything advanced and the machine came back and repeated that much like a combine harvester working up and down uh, a wheat field uh, at harvest time now Wheatley Hill didn't do that. Wheatley Hill was never mechanised. They tried to mechanise Wheatley Hill Colliery after the Second World War using a German technique. Um, it, it, it's a rather a strange thing. Wheatley Hill was always manual hewing of coal, filling of coals with picks or with pneumatic picks and shovels, either onto a conveyor belt or into, directly into a tub. But on long wall faces in Wheatley Hill, again, this cycling nature took place, but instead of having conveyor belts where, on a face where men would fill the coal, Wheatley Hill again was quite unique. 
they, they tended to use what we refer to as skips and they were steel structures that were dragged up and down the face by a haulage engine. Uh, imagine it as a steel box, like a sledge, with an open end and at the back it had a trap door. And the miners, uh, during the filling cycle, would fill the coal from the coal face onto the track where this skip sledge rang. It was dragged along the face, it scraped the coal up that the men had filled there and it carried it to the hopper which was in the central tunnel or gate as they were called of the actual coal face and that emptied through that hopper onto a conveyor belt and the conveyor belt then carried the coal away from the coal face into uh, an area where tubs had been uh, stored uh, in a referred to as a landing and the empty tubs would pass underneath the conveyor belt at the loading point and they would be filled with coal that had been fed there from the face by conveyor. Those tubs were then pulled by haulage engines out to the shaft to be loaded into the cages to be brought to the surface. Now that's what happened at Waitley Hill Colliery on a long wall face. By a long wall face, imagine a tunnel where uh, at one end of a, an area of coal and then they would branch off at, at right angles for po probably a hundred yards and form a coal face in the coal seam uh, and that linked up with another tunnel running parallel to the first tunnel. And that created the situation where you had two tunnels, two gates, and one coal face. Now the cyclic operation that took place at Waitley Hill simply meant that at one point in time the coal would be cut using a coal cutter which undercut the coal seam to a depth of about four foot six. The next phase was the driller, the, the two drillers or the one driller would come onto the face and use an electric drill. This is laterally an electric drill to drill boreholes into the coal face again for the same depth roughly four feet. Um, the next thing that happened um, the shot fire would come in and put blasting powder into these pre-drilled holes and fill it up with blasting powder put detonators in and in one go would actually blast down the coal so there was loose coals there ready and then the actual filling shift would commence and this is where the men would come onto the face with the shovels and the picks and then shovel the, the loose coal that had been blasted down onto the track uh, which would be carried away as I just said either by a skip or laterally by face conveyor just an ordinary conveyor belt that ran along the face and the, the mechanism was the, the miners, the fillers, fill the coal. As they were filling the coal, they were putting timber props and timber bars to support the roof because um, the roof has got to be supported. Yeah. Um, until the whole of the face had been cleared of that loose coal. And that was the end of the cycle. So the cycle had been uh, prep, cut, drill, blast, fill. Now at that point the face has advanced four foot six. So now what they've got to do in the next part of the, the cycle is to move everything forward four foot six. So the process can start all over again. So that meant on a good coal face once a day you would go through the cycle and you would fill off four foot six of coal. And the same thing would happen the next day and the next day. Now that happened on long wall faces, they were called coal faces that were of length. In other areas of the colliery, again, right up to the day the colliery closed, um, the, they used a different method of mining in, in terms of, it was still manual, but it was basically all manual. You, you had what were called coal hewers, who used to hew a short face of about um, four yards wide and their job was to actually go in 
hew down the coal and if need be drill and blast it, fill the coal into tubs. The, the empty tubs were brought in by, by pit pony uh, with a putter who used to drive the pony to pull the, the empty tubs into these little areas. Um, the coal hewers would then fill the tubs with the coal they'd hewn down. The putter then connects his pony up to the full tubs and then he takes them out to the landing where again they gathered together into what were called sets or a, a train of 20 or 40 uh, tubs of coal which were then hauled back to the shaft. Now that happened from time immemorial to the day the colliery closed. There were coal hewers with pit ponies and putters. There were coal face fillers. Now, I start at the beginning by saying after the Second World War, they tried to mechanise number one pit at Wheatley Hill because that's where all the good quality in terms of um, high price coal was produced. And they used a German technique um, which wasn't very successful. They had a centralised big haulage um, engine and they, by using ropes, they, they channeled the ropes to a long wall face where there were these, what I've mentioned, skips. But what in fact they tried was to actually weld onto the size of these skips uh, big, strong picks which act like a claw and at the same time they had a compressed air uh, arrangement of rams that would force the skip over into the coal face and they would rip, they would haul the, the, this skip with the picks welded into the side of them. They would haul that up the coal face and back down the coal face and in theory it was stripping the coal as it was travelling up and it was falling onto the face and the skip would carry it out. But they tried it but it was never ever successful. So that had only tried for about 18 months after the investment and then they went back to the traditional hand filling mechanism. But towards the end of the life of the colliery in, in, in the 1960s, 64 onwards, they tried in one seam of coal uh, using what was commonly called flight loaders which were basically just big coal cutters instead of having one um, one jib to undercut the seam they actually used a multi jib coal cutter and it went up and down well it wasn't it was hauled down in one direction and it it churned the coal and deposited onto a a, a coal face but even on faces like that they still had to get materials, uh, pit props, support bars, girders. They had to be taken into the coal face. And again, it was pit ponies and men manhandling them that actually did that job. So, the, yeah, there were about four, four stables where homeless pit ponies were stored and kept underground and were continually only in use until the colliery closed. They never ever tried any method of continuous mining. Even the mechanisation that they did try, the only part of the element that might have been considered continuous mining was the German technique in the 1940s. Um, surprisingly, in the 50s, they developed a system uh, much similar to that, which was called um, the coal plough, and it used uh, an armoured conveyor belt, uh, which was quite simply a, a steel uh, conveyor down the face and on the face side, hauled by great big chains, was a big powerful bladed plough plane and it ripped in the same way as the initial one tried at um, Wheatley Hill. It ripped the coal from the coal face continually up and down and by that time hydraulics were in use so every time it took uh, an, an 8 inch or a, a 10 inch slice of coal the, the width, the length of the coal face the actual conveyor belt was rammed over beside the coal face so it could go up and down and it was continually in contact with the coal, uh, coal face 
and it was continually stripping off in short lengths, uh, short widths, um, the coal that way. And again, that was all mechanical. There was no manual filling of coal just at the at the ends where the, the actual drive elements there would be men employed to to advance it. The interesting thing to to mention as well, you can imagine just as in a, a farmer's field when he's combining his wheat, the, once he's he started, there's an element of that field that is stripped bare. Bear in mind underground as you're mining a coal face and you're advancing forward, you're taking the coal out and you are leaving behind, for want of a better expression, a gap. That gap is the, actually the, the rock above the coal seam, and that rock has got to fall. So one of the most tricky and dangerous elements at Whitney Hill Colliery, uh, which was carried out, was carried out by the drawers and pullers, and their job was, uh, once the coal had been filled off by the fillers, they would go in and withdraw the supports from the section uh, that had been mined previously. And the roof was just allowed to cave, to fall in. And as a young boy, that to somebody who'd never seen it before, that was frightening to see. Again, as the, as the fillers fill the coal off, they put more supports in to support that roof. So if you like, you've got two elements, you've got two widths. One, uh, yesterday's coal gap, which becomes the gap where the conveyor belt runs now, and today's coal gap, which tomorrow will be the place where the conveyor belt will run, and the old one is just allowed to cave in behind it. In, in, in times that it was so bad that they would withdraw the miners off the face, they would use the expression, the gove's on the wi on the work. The gove was the, the expression they used for the, the old empty space. And you can imagine, once a new coal face starts to work and they're advancing it forward, it doesn't... You can see the roof sagging down uh, into the area that has been extracted. And if it suddenly just goes in one go, it, it can do all kinds of things. It can disturb timber. It can actually reverse because you get such a draft with it, it can reverse the flow of air along the face. It, 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 to someone like me who saw it for the first time, it was a frightening thing. Simply, uh, timber props and timber bars were used to support it, um, and they were reinforced by what were called chocks, which would just simply imagine that little game that children play, you, you build up, with, with little bits of timber crisscross and the op the object is to, to pull a piece out with something in. Well, the same thing was done on the, the blocks were, were six inches square and about two foot long and they built these up to support it. Um, and they had a mechanism whereby the, the puller and drawer could pull the mechanism and that allowed the chalk to collapse so they could reuse the timber again. Um, the last three years of the colliery's life, uh, they had an advancement. They started to use very, very old hydraulic um, roof support props that had come from other colliery's. And the first thing, they had to be reconditioned and they were taken down. And again, these were activated with a, with a lever and the man used to pump the hydro, the miner used to pump the hydraulic to actually lift the pop up. The, the prop up to the roof to support the roof um, uh, and that's the way it was as the colliery closed. They also tried to use simple hydraulic chocks instead of wooden chocks. They had water filled, they looked like dust bins, one of their expression. You filled them full of water with a high pressure hose and it lifted up and it supported the roof and then when you wanted to move them you release the water, the fluid that was inside it, and drag them forward. But again, in comparison, a mechanised face, everything was hydraulic, all the supports were hydraulic. The, 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 the were, not at Wheatley Hill, I'm talking about a, a colliery that was, was fully mechanised. 
all things were hydraulic. The hydraulics did. They moved themselves forwards. They pushed the conveyors forwards. They supported the roof. And the miner just went up and down working levers to actually support the roof. Whereas at a quarry like Waitley Hill, there would be a team of three or four men who were actually uh, recovering all props and chocks and allowing the roof to fall at the same time, making sure that the working area of the quarry is kept safe.